So welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us. This is Gathering Voices, a weekly conversation with faith leaders and peace and justice activists to inspire us and help us to delve deeper into um, the work that we have in front of us to build a more equitable and just and peaceful world. And I'm really happy to have as our guest this afternoon, our uh, Wink Fellow, Pastor Tabitha Holly, and we will explain as we go and then um, a bit later exactly what the uh, Wink Fellowship is. But for now, I would like to introduce everyone to Tabitha and um, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be here. So... Tabitha, if you could just begin a little bit with where you're located and just who you are and who are your people. I love that question, where your people a lot. Um, it says a lot about where we are, where we come from. Uh, so um, my name is Tabitha again. Uh, my pronouns are she and they. Um, and I am... Um, I'm from a really small town in South Georgia, Dawson, Georgia, near the Albany area. So if folks, um, maybe uh, a reference point is the Albany Civil Rights Movement. I'm from that particular area. Um, a lot of uh, folks that I grew up with, a lot of my, uh, my elder comrades, if you will, um, actually were folks who registered people to vote in that, in that time um, of American history. Um, and so, yeah, I'm from a small town, a, a county we call Terrible Terrell, um, because of actually a lot of the the police brutality that that occurred and happened in that particular era as well. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, that's where I'm from. My my folks are are black elders, uh, black movement elders, and also, um, yeah, working class folks. Um, I. Um, when I graduated high school, um, I, I wanted to go to Spelman College, and so I did. Uh, and I was able to also kind of develop a really, really uh, amazing uh, queer community there, uh, and kind of was able to do some study abroad in India when I was in college. And that really took me, a, a really small town girl, out of my element, um, and really showed me a lot about um, just the power of. Um, diversity. Uh, and so I always, I always talk about that experience um, being very important in, uh, to my life. Um, it was that experience in India that also helped me realize I wanted to go to seminary um, and kind of think about uh, religion in a more global context, because uh, I came from, you know, small town, you know, everybody's mainly Baptist or AME. Uh, and so, yeah, I decided to go to seminary and um, think about, um, yeah, where we could go theologically in terms of movement. Now, yeah. I, I, I know that you come from a, a line from generations of pastors. And um, what was it like to grow up with that and step into those shoes? And um, I want to ask the, the gender layout of that. And if you were... Um, the first woman and likely the first queer woman and what that was like for you. Yeah. Um, being third generation um, is, um, is interesting, I will say, because I think being from the rural South brings with it its own kind of flair. Um, and so um, kind of the tradition um, kind of the traditions are kind of folk traditions. They're kind of traditions that come from um just from real, uh, I would say, class struggle um, in, a, in a unique way. And so I would say um, I, I am a third generation. I'm also the first of that generation to go to seminary to receive a theological education. Uh, and so that kind of um, allows me to be able to reflect on um, how things were growing up with a little bit of grace, if you will, um, because, um, you know, when we think about patriarchy and we think about queer phobia, we think about transphobia, we think about those things as really and honestly being, you know, bits and parcels of, of white supremacy. Uh, and so, and white supremacy is, is really, um, 
you know, which really prevailed in my in my little small town and, and in my in my area, in my neck of the woods where I grew up. So um, so, yeah, when I think about it in that framework, it it, it doesn't exactly absolve uh, the people I grew up around, um, but it also just allows me to be able to think about the ways in which sexuality and gender uh, were um we're not looked at or seen in the ways in which we're able to see them today. So yeah, that's kind of how I relate to it at this, at this point. I love the use of that word with grace, that what it is to, to walk through that with grace. And um, what was that like at, at seminary school and how, um, how diverse was that? How diverse was seminary and, um, yeah, what challenges or supports did you come across? And if you could also talk a little bit about um, Black liberation and its theological grounding for you. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, when I got ready to apply for seminary, uh, which was very unexpected, I thought I was going to go straight for a PhD um, in women's studies or American studies, um, but I wasn't quite clear about what it is that I I was being called to do. Um, I I just felt um, like I needed to be in a I needed to be in a city, uh, and the only place in which I really could apply and be in a city was Union, <laughs> um, particularly a large city, um, a space where I would be challenged theologically, a place where I would be uh, challenged to think about um, double belonging, a place where I would be challenged to think about. Uh, yeah, just the power of, uh, of multi-faith movement, right, um, of, of interreligious engagement. So that was very important for me. And, and at the same time, um, Black liberation theology was very important for me. Uh, and there was a way in which uh, Professor James Cone could talk about um, Black people, particularly the Black people that I grew up with, the Black people that I loved, um, that uh, that was able to hold them with that type of grace that I talked about a little bit earlier, that was kind of uh, able to articulate their kind of theological um, perspectives around Jesus and the cross, right? And Jesus kind of being this this uh, this figure uh, that could identify uh, with the with the struggles of of the Black working class, and so that was that was very important to me uh, to study with someone who. Um, who was clear about being able to take that theology back home, right? So that it, so it doesn't sit in just the halls of academia, but that it also is able to go uh, into the places where it matters. And so, uh, yeah, that's a little bit about my journey of going into seminary and uh, was very clear, you know, that in my theological training and study, what I was studying would have to be able to travel. It would need to be able to go back home. And so uh, that 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 is important to me, and, and still remains important to me um, uh, in in terms of being in the Bronx now. So yeah. Thank you. I like to you know really I, I like how you emphasize the universal perspective because faith is universal across religions and denominations that those of us that that know the the trueness of faith know that um god is never about hatred and god is always for empowerment of of society towards towards a, a better world and and a better community if you could talk just a little bit about yourself in terms of um, how you would how you define yourself intersectionally, and how it informs your process, both as a, a faith leader and as a community organizer. That's a really great question, and that's not something I think I've thought about um, until recently. Uh, so, um, identify as a queer black woman, a uh, working class uh, woman. Um, and I think um, I think those identities are particularly important, I think in this in this day and age uh, to be able to come together and be able to still identify as a faith leader um, because we don't see uh, people with those identities often uh, represented in in religious spaces. Um, but I think also um, when we think about loving kindness and we think about compassion and we think about um, 
what it takes to build and sustain uh, a movement for justice in this country. And we're thinking about, or we should be thinking about the experiences of those on the margins. Um, and, and I think um, what it means to, um, yeah, like be with my people, uh, with, with the training that I have, I think about, um, I think about what we can create together because we are creating from our own experiences. We are not, um, we're not reading from a book. We're not using our knowledge from uh, just something that we read in seminary, but we're, we are actually thinking about what we need on our, in our day-to-day lives. We think about this concept in uh, community organizing that we call self-interest. So we're thinking about literally improving our own conditions. Uh, and I think that that pulls me and that moves me to, to preach uh, grounded uh, sermons theologically. It, it pulls me to think about, um, yeah, what do I have to say when we get down to the protest? And, and does it link back? Does it come back to my desire to be free as a person? Um, and so that's kind of where I'm at. I, I think I'm, I'm at what I'm, where I'm going here is this, is this concept of self-interest is that like, I'm not fighting for someone. I am fighting for myself. I'm fighting for my own liberation. Uh, and that and that is a beautiful thing. Yeah. So speaking of of uh, working for liberation, you are our current uh, Walter Wink and June Keener Wink fellow. Um, for any of our listeners who aren't familiar uh, with Walter Wink, he was an internationally known author, a, a Bible scholar, a peacemaker, um, a longtime Fellowship of Reconciliation member from 1935 to 2012 when he passed away. And he was a pastor with an abiding commitment to what he called the third way the way of active nonviolent resistance to um, oppressive powers. And I want to ask you um, how, how you came to realize and how you came to think about nonviolence as a tool for confronting the state um, and how you heard at the same time also like how that relates related to you as you have read and um, think about Walter Wink's uh, body of work? Yeah, um, I think I was talking with you in June about this about a week or two, or two, or two ago. Um, and um, I was uh, framing uh, the work of Dr. King uh, in a way that that relates to you know my own people's story in the South in particular. So when you, um, you know, I grew up hearing stories about um, about white mobs. I, I grew up hearing stories about, and I, quite frankly, at this at this rate of, of fascism that we're in, I I know that there still are some some white mobs where I'm from, um, and 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 the, the story of fascism still uh, takes its shape and takes its form where I'm from as well. And so I, I'm very clear about that. And I think that when I think about nonviolence as a form of resistance, I think about strategy. I think about, um, I think about, uh, I think about the sayings of Dr. King and saying, uh, and saying, you know, um, when we, when we go out to fight, we're very clear that we cannot fight the state violently. We have to be, uh, we have to be creative we have to be innovative and we have to use many tools in our toolbox. Um, and so um, I will say in terms of confronting the state, um, I think I'm using a bit of Wink's work uh, to kind of think about with my people, how can we get creative? How can we, how can we utilize uh, the work of, uh, of nonviolence through scripture, uh, through New Testament interpretation? Uh, to move our people uh, to confront the state. And so, um, you know, and there's so many ways in which I know in the Bronx right now, um, we are confronting the state. And those those kind of methods kind of range from like artful forms of resistance. And um, I think I'm really, really moved by, uh, by young people in my neighborhood who are, who are just moving in a powerful way with their art and with their words. Um, but I think that um, I, I'm... You know, as I continue to be in this conversation around nonviolence, there is kind of a, 
a generational dialogue about what is nonviolence and what is self-defense that came up in the last session. Um, but if I can, in some way, dig a little bit deeper into uh, nonviolent forms of resistance that, like I said, are creative and, and allow us to think about the fact that we must confront the state <laughs> and, that we, and that we cannot fight white mobs, <laughs> um, then, then I might be going somewhere. But I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be clear and say, I'm, I get a little stuck uh, generationally. Sure, I was, I was actually going to ask you just that. And you know, for me, I often uh, think about the absurdity of thinking that we can use physical power to go up against the industrial military complex or up against the degree of hatred that you, you know, you call it white mobs and there's Confederate flags um, just outside the, the borders of the small town that I live in. We don't have that kind of hatred. And so the necessity of finding where our power and strength is, which is shining that mirror on the violence. And it, it's not, um, in any way. And as my uh, friend Graylin Hagler is on here, uh, as we like to discuss with each other, pacifism has nothing to do with being pacifist. Um, sorry, with being passive. <laughs> sorry, pacifism has nothing to do with being passive. And it's active, nonviolent resistance. It's at no time uh, a stillness. It's um, it's a confrontation. Um yeah, but thank you for for answering that, and I appreciate the the struggle that you have in in addressing that. And um, as we all work together with the same goals, and knowing that there are many difficult conversations to have. Uh, back to Walter Wink a little bit. Uh, Walter talks a lot about the powers that be, and I'm wondering if you can just tell us a little bit about what that is, and then also um, how you came to find out about the Wink Fellowship and um, what what uh, drew you to apply for it. Yeah, the powers that be. Mm. Um, well, I, I think, you know, you were asking me earlier about, about my identity and I told you a bit about, you know, self-interest for me. Um, and another thing I wanted to name around, I think, nonviolence and how the state operates um, is that I, um, I had an interesting experience actually a few weeks ago where I was talking with someone about, you know, the first Walter Wink series. And um, I was talking about how, you know, the military, the military is a poverty draft. And how um, interestingly, you know, in my, in, you know, in my little small town, I almost ended up getting recruited to the military and a lot of my family and friends get recruited to the military. And, and at, the end, at the end of the day, this is a conversation about class. This is a conversation about people um, being told in high school and middle school, you're not college material um, and making a decision, you know, maybe inadvertently to choose violence. And you're talking about black and brown young people. And we found out the same thing. We found out the same thing um, in the Wink Fellowship, uh, in the first Wink Fellowship talk with Claude, that the same thing is happening in these urban cities around the country. And so the question is um, always, how do we get creative about thinking about and talking about choosing the way of nonviolence, choosing the way, um, cho saying uh, up front, like I am not for militarism in particular, I'm not for state violence. Uh, and so what I, I think, um, I found this, this Wink Fellowship actually um, through a great friend of mine who is working in political education. Uh, Cause I also think that political education, uh, it, it also forces our brains to, 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 to think uh, more expansively. It, it, it forces us to have to think about how, what is the best way to say this? What is the best way to relay this message to this audience? Um, and I think that, again, these are conversations about strategy for me. And um, yeah, I'm in a, I think for me in my life, I am in just a deep period of, uh, of discernment. And I think this fellowship kind of allows me to be in study 
to be in study about about militarism, to be in study about trauma, to be in study about uh, what does it mean to be an anti-imperialist in this in this era. Um, and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to learning more about, I think, the powers that be uh, that affect our people, um, that kind of force our people to take the side of militarism and take the side of violence, uh, because more often than not, again, it, it does all in a way it does all stem back to to white supremacy it it, it stems back to um to hatred of course but it, it stems back to uh to, to a sense of of control and domination um and when we think about who it affects the most we think about communities uh, where I've come from and communities where I am now. Um, so, so yeah, that's kind of where I am, I think, in terms of the fellowship and the connection with the powers that be. Um, is, yeah, how, how do we get creative about, about the move toward nonviolence? Yeah, so you gave- In, in communities that are, that, that are violent, that are, that are being moved by, by violence. Absolutely. So uh, you hosted a conversation last week at the People's Forum in New York City, which is um, a place of political education and organizing. And it was a conversation with Claude Copeland, who is um, a veteran part of About Face and part of um, Veterans for Peace. And, you know, one of the things that struck me as I watched that is, is I saw his PhD. PTSD, like in his body, I've I've worked closely uh, with veterans, and you know, so it immediately clicked for me that it's not just um, the violence of the war, but the violence of militarism itself is is so wounding to both those that are in the receiving end and those that come whether through poverty draft or through conscription in other countries um, to, to be perpetrators of it. And um, I really appreciate uh, how you've worked with him as um, part of the uh, New Day Church, where you spent three years as, as a pastor. And I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about the New Day Church um, and about moving on from it as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, New Day Church is a um, is a boundary crossing ministry in the Northwest Bronx, um, and, and uh, New Day is a space that challenges all um, that that church in. Um, that church is and that church should be. Um, and and for, for three years, I got to work um, just in incredible community um, with uh, folks who were teachers and artists and organizers and thinkers. And um, when I tell you uh, my life has changed from being in this part of the Bronx and being able to, to move and to organize and to um, be in solidarity uh, with, with folks in the Bronx, I mean, it has been just life changing. Um, and I would just say that, you know, you talk about uh, folks like Claude in particular. And one of the things that I think about as we, as we are in this conversation um, is I think about powerlessness. And I think about how powerless um, the powers that be want our people to feel. And I think about how, um, how that powerlessness um, can kind of um, move itself from a place of innocence uh, just to a place of, um, of hopelessness. Um, and, and, how, and how that just becomes a part of that system of uh, from the high school to to military, from high school to policing, from high school to probation, from high school to whatever the situation is. If it's not um, if it's not a way uh, into the criminal justice system, it is a way to just choose violence. It's to choose. It's to say like this is my only choice. I am only smart enough. I am only good enough to be able to do this thing for the state. Um, and so I, I think that um, I think being a new day kind of gave me an otherwise possibility. I think I was able to see people um, move and operate in their power and change their lives. Um, and, and, and these people are they were from the Bronx. I was able to see people just say, you know, I'm not going to allow uh, racism or white supremacy or, or sexism or 
or ages and to, to, to stop me from, from being in my possibility, from being in my power. And I think we were only able to do that in community. I think we were only able to do that um, by being able to show up for each other in terms of, um, yeah, like just um, providing kind of emotional and spiritual support when we know that we are in the face of horrible systems. Yeah, and so I, th- I think that there is that there was just that awareness at New Day in a way that it's not always present in a lot of churches and a lot of faith based. Space. And there was there was conversation about it, about the fact that we were being kind of like crushed, you know, by the system over the last three years and being able to kind of name that and be able to also present our dreams and our possibility together. I think that that was just a powerful experience. And I think that, we, you know, being able to hear from Claude last week was just one of those examples. Um it was just so powerful to me to hear uh, a person that went through that level of pain be able to articulate 42 wishes for his life. You know, the state doesn't want that. The state wants to take away our capacity to be able to dream and transform ourselves. And and I just think that New Day was a place um, of just miracles, just miracles. Um, And I think that in this transition, I am, um, I'm reflecting on, on the power that we were able to hold together. Um, and I think that that is, my, that is what I'm supposed to do right now is just be in that reflection as I think about um, what is next for my life. Mm, and, and thank you for, for expressing that grace of being um, in that place of reflection as you contemplate next stages. And um, I wanna take a, a brief um, transition to uh, we'll call it a commercial break to talk about uh, an initiative that Fellowship of Reconciliation, um, some of the me- members of the Council of Elders, um, including uh, including uh, folks we have on this call, so Hara, um, to and Code Pink, we are calling for a Christmas truce to the war in Ukraine. And, you know, we talk, we've been talking about the harm and the violence and the pain from war, and we're watching it right now with countless thousands of civilians uh, in Ukraine already having died and 14 million having been displaced. And um, then also we talk about the pain of having to serve in wars. And we can think of both the Ukrainian and the Russian soldier, soldiers, as well as the Belarusian soldiers, all of whom are conscripted right now. And so as, as Christians right now are start around the world are starting to prepare for Christmas, and as Jews, um, myself included, are awaiting the Festival of Lights holiday, Hanukkah, we are putting out a call for a Christmas truce in the tradition of the Christmas truce of 1914, when roughly 100,000 German and British soldiers along the Western Front in World War II declared an unofficial Christmas truce and ceased hostilities for a short period. And we are calling on uh, faith leaders and faith institutions to sign on to a statement um, for the sanctity of life on this planet to urge our government uh, to take a leadership role in bringing this horrific conflict to an end through ceasefire and negotiated settlement. And I'm going to put in the chat uh, the link, and I know we have quite a few faith leaders on this call, some of whom have signed the uh, statement already, and I want to encourage uh, faith leaders on this call who have not signed the statement to please do so, and everyone on this call to go back to your congregations and your faith communities and ask those communities to um, add their name to this call for as we move into the holiday season. And our goal is to get 100 faith leaders um, before the start of Advent. So um, as we can move into that season to, to really put out a call for nonviolence in the midst of a terrible conflict. All right, so going back to, of course, all things are connected, but uh, going back to some parts of our conversation and um, Walter Wink, 
So one of Walter Wink's books um, began as a pamphlet that FOR published and was later turned into a book called Homosexuality and the, and the Bible. Compar- he compared fundamentalist Christian focus on rules and norms and impressed into the service of the domination system with a shift to a love ethic exemplified by Jesus. How do how does this contrast resonate with you and especially in faith communities and in this time of horrifically heightened attacks on queer folk and specifically um, our trans brothers and sisters? Yeah, I think um, I, I think it's very important that we think about, you know, like you said, the inter- like the interconnectedness of these of these many topics. Um, so um, so so for me, you know, I think of when I think about when I think about sexuality, I think about um, the ways in which uh, you know uh, Christianity, uh, white supremacy, particularly I would say like white Christian nationalism or um, or Christian supremacy. As I think about how those kind of ways of being. Uh, kind of try to force themselves onto my life, right? And the lives of people that I care about. Um, I think about how, again, how these things are are connected. I don't think about them as being kind of disconnected. And I think that uh, what we are called to um, is to think about uh, just the ways in which Again, the, the, there these things. Help, give me one. I need one minute. Actually, I need to cut yes, down the television. Please. I'm in a break I'll room. That, I, I'll go back to talking about the the yes. Christmas because I'm just really excited about it. I I don't know who else on this call knew about it. I did not know um, about the Christmas truce, and you know, in looking it up, we see the the soldiers playing soccer with each other, and we realize that there always are these opportunities for creativity and something unique. You know, so many times uh, the conflicts that we're in, whether confronting Christian nationalism or confronting the war in Ukraine and possibility of nuclear annihilation, how often we think they are hopeless. And yet you get these moments, right? You get these moments when soldiers in the middle of the first world war, this war to end all wars, that was, you know, the most horrific thought possible until it was able to get worse, um, just decided to put down their arms for the moment and join hands. And, you know, that, that always reminds me and gives me hope that another world is possible. And I'm going to bring Tabitha back on. Hi, yes. Uh, I needed to cut down the television. I was, um, another thing I'm doing right now in my life is I am um, doing CPE for the first time at, um, at a hospital. I'm actually in a hospice uh, space. And so I'm in a break room. <laughs> so I am um, very much, uh, I'm kind of like taking a break from that and there's a lot of noise in the background. So I'm, I'm trying to really focus here. So thank you for your grace. Um, so um, I, I just want to name uh, again, when we think about, when I, when I think about queerness in particular and that word and that naming, I think about, I always go back to uh, kind of the work of Kathy Cohen, uh, who is out of Chicago and started the Black Youth uh, Project. Um, so, um, and, and I think about uh, the fact that kind of queerness uh, in the 70s and 80s kind of positioned um, us to be able to think about what does it mean to, to fight? What does it mean to stand in our power? What does it mean to, um, to fight to live? What does it mean to fight to love? What does it mean to fight to exist? And I think that uh, when I think about resilience, um, I think about queer people. I think about when I think about boldness, I think about queer people, I think about what it takes to be able to love all of who you are and to be able to love another um, just in a uh, in a way that is outside of dominant culture, outside of of dominant uh, reality. Uh, And so um, I don't really find myself in the probably in the same position as Wink in terms of what does it mean to make an argument? 
to fundamentalists per se. Um, but I do think about what does it mean to empower queer people? I do think about what does it mean to, um, to think about how our, uh, how our bodily expressions, how uh, allow us to be able to think expansively again and creatively and outside of, uh, outside of dominant systems. Uh, and so like that's kind of where I am in, in terms of, of queerness being kind of a place of, of power and a place of possibility for me. Um, and and I, I look forward to I, I kind of started on um, on the Bible on homosexuality and I kind of put it down a bit because I was like, oh, wow, this is really interesting. This was written in a particular time period. And I do think that um, I do think that the arguments are particularly important. Um, but I'm also in my mind, I'm like you know, in, in terms of fundamentalism, there are people who are just anti-queer. There are people that are just anti-LGBTQ. They are, um, they're deeply afraid of their own sexualities. They're deeply afraid of their own bodies. They're deeply afraid of, of who they are and they're deeply uh, insecure about it. Uh, and I don't really, for, for me, I'm just like, I don't really care to argue with it. Um, but if we want to think about uh, the power of queer sexuality and the power of, um, of queer sexuality, even in movement spaces, I think that we are going in a good direction and we think about, um, you know, we always talk about the Black Lives Matter movement in particular, even being led and led by queer women, because there is something about queerness that allows us to think otherwise, that allows us to think about, um, to, to think about things in a much more expansive way. Uh, and so, yeah, even as, even as it, you know, we're in this conversation about militarism, we're in this conversation about, I, I'm able to think about, um, just a possibility for my people because I know um, I know what it means to be those several margins behind, uh, and so. But I but I don't just think about it in in a pejorative way. I think about again. I think about my power. Yeah. Oh, that's just really think beautiful. About what? I'm going to listen to that again because it was really um, affecting for me. So. As I momentarily am going to bring on my colleague, Ethan, um, for the Q&A portion, um, I want to specifically invite um, some of our, our general, you know, we, we're talking, you were, we were talking about different generations in activism and liberation, and we have some, you know, really incredible folks on this call. So, you know, I want to specifically invite Sohara and um, Reverend uh, Graylin, if you would like to, we'd be happy to put you on camera if you have specific questions. And I want to, um, now I'm going to hand it over uh, to Ethan. And I know that we have a question from Bill right away. And so if you um, want to start with that. Uh, okay, I didn't see the one from Bill, but um, uh, I will find that. I, I did see one from Carolyn uh, Scar that I was going to pull into the um, Q&A portion. And again, Tabitha, thank you so much for uh, sharing the, these words with us. Um, and, and Carolyn had asked um, earlier in the conversation when you were talking about the state, um, uh, in what ways do you want to confront the state? And I know because of your work, um, you speak about so many of these different powers and principalities and domination systems, and you've worked locally and statewide and at multiple levels. How do you really, how do you focus on that uh, process and, and the particularities of confronting the state? Thank you for that question, Carolyn. Um, so I think over the last couple of years, um, I started Pasturing New Day about six months before the pandemic. And so the last three years, I've basically been pastoring through a pandemic in the Bronx. And what that has meant um, about halfway through my time has been um, that I've been thinking actually about policing. And I've been thinking about policing in the Bronx, and I've been thinking about how much money goes into the, to the police and how much um, how much money goes into the military industrial complex. And being in the Bronx in particular, I think about how that money could be reallocated. Um, and I've been thinking uh, kind of strategically about uh, about some of the powers and principalities in this city and how they have been able to somehow uh, grasp power 
uh, and be able to to kind of seize money uh, that we could be using for social services, we could be using for mental health, we could be using for restorative justice. And I've been, um, in terms of how I've been confronting the state, I have been uh, working alongside uh, a wonderful group of young people in the Bronx called Sisters and Brothers United uh, with the Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition. And this group of young people has been fighting to get police out of their schools. I mean, we have been marching across the Brooklyn Bridge and we have been, you know, I, we ha I have been with these, these, a lot of these young people are actually queer as well um, and, and, and really need resources. And they're looking at, they're looking at school, they're looking at their funding go into militarization in their schools. Uh, and so I think that just kind of walking beside them and being with them and speaking with them has just been powerful in terms of, it's for me, that's been one of the most powerful ways in which I've been able to confront the state, I think in the last year or two. Um, it's just being with, you know, another generation, right? That is even younger than me that is saying, we are seeing where militarized violence is not working. We are seeing that it does not protect us. Please stop using us as pawns in order to do whatever politically you want to do. You know, we don't need that. Um, we actually need resources. We actually need services. Um, another way in which I, I think that the major ways in which I've been confronting the state over the last few years have just been in my local neighborhood. So I live in the Northwest Bronx right now. And there's also there's a large development in the Northwest Bronx called the Kingsbridge Armory. And the Kingsbridge Armory is is gigantic. It is it, it's literally an armory. It's one of the largest armories in the in the world. Um, and there have just been conversations over the last twenty or so years that have been started by young people about what, how can we use this armory in a way that actually pours back into a neighborhood uh, that has been so depleted. How do we use this armory to be able to? Um, repair the harm that the state has done uh, to our community. And so um, I've been kind of in those conversations as well, I think over the last six months. Uh, and so that has been a powerful way of also confronting the state is kind of being in rooms with people kind of thinking about how can we get creative um, and use uh, what we have to our benefit, right? And not continue to funnel money again into militarized violence. Um, and so those are just some of the ways um, that, that I've been confronting the state recently. And um, I'm looking forward to, I think, what's going to happen over the next year as well. But I do think also that right now I'm, I'm in a pause um, and I'm not I'm kind of called to just kind of sit in some silence, some stillness and be in some discernment about what I am called to confront. Uh, and so. So, yeah, that's where I'm at right now. It really strikes me that with what you just shared, that in your conversation last week with Claude Copeland that Ariel mentioned, Claude said this one quote that really stuck with me among all so many things, but uh, he heard said words to the effect of, no matter whether or not you're in the military, we're all in a military mindset and how that frames so much of what we, and particularly for those young people with whom you're working and walking, how powerful that is. Um, um, I, I, um, you, uh, I think, said you're right now uh, maybe in the hospital where you work, and I'm going to invite uh, someone else who might be joining us from a hospital as well, um, our colleague and brother uh, Vince Artis, uh, who wants to ask a question. So I'm asking him to unmute. Tabitha, I just want to say what you're doing right now is amazing. I mean, amazing. I mean, from you discussed about the military, that is definitely tells us black and brown people, yeah, college ain't for us whatsoever. Come to the military and stuff. I mean, I mean, you hit that right on the head, you know, just like guns, drugs, violence. I mean, they got a camera in every city corner, you know, but the DOC, Department of Corrections is big business. So that's always going to be extreme by the money. Even women who's pregnant in prison, they try to get the mothers to give their babies up for adoption because that's big money inside adoption. You know, everything, Tabitha, you stand for, I mean, I'm a witch you 100%. Not just me, but FOR is always definitely, we hear the support, 
guide whatever we need you need and stuff and anything else we definitely in the building here for you and hey don't get it twisted either how you how they say bx they throw up the x sign i'm born and raised in brooklyn so i know the struggle nothing but good things for you and your family and everybody on this line love you all and talk to you again real soon everybody thank you so much vince always Good to be with you. Thank you for those words. And I think uh, maybe something that Larry Coleman just put into the chat, uh, Larry also a military veteran himself, um, or, or sorry, um, conscience objector uh, to, to the military, um, wrote his wondering about a culture within poverty and black and brown communities for finding the power and alternatives to the military. So picking up kind of what Vince was saying and what you were talking about, Tabitha, would you speak more about that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think that there are threads in my life and I, and it's so hard for me because sometimes I do so much until I'm like, how does this connect to, th <laughs> you know? And so I think it is important. But I, I can't stress enough how important it is to be able to take a pause and be able to take a beat and be able to make connections and be able to think about um, the kind of the stops in our lives that kind of link us back to things in the past. So, so my work, um, I think, you know, like I said, working with the young people over the last couple of years um, to get police out of schools has, has led me to think about a lot of things, particularly about young people um, and what it is that young people are going through in their day-to-day -day lives. But also when we think about funding and we think about education, we think about the fact that education is often underfunded, particularly public education. Right. And so we think about these are systematic problems. Um, we think about the fact that in my small town, for example, by the time I got to ninth grade, there was no art class. There was no music class. There was no way for my for me to be engaged uh, outside of what maybe business and agriculture at that time. Um, I, 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 something told me to go in the direction of agriculture and I didn't. Um, but now in my life, I'm actually seeing that that maybe that might have been a good possibility for me is to think about, you know, the power of the land and the power of working the land. I didn't think about that. I didn't have the tools to be able to imagine what can I do with my life outside of going to the military or staying home. And so um, I, I think that, again, this goes back to finding our power. It comes to, to getting resources into our communities. It comes down to um, black and brown uh, students in schools getting the same resources as white students in private schools. Um, and and it, it comes down to, uh, yeah, it comes down to, to what we are provided uh, yeah, it, it, I think on an educational level, I think that I think this is again, this, this is a systematic problem is that our options are incredibly limited. And by the time we come to 18 and 19, it's like, what else am I supposed to do with <laughs> do with my life? Um, and I don't think that again, I don't think that um, that that white students that are able to afford a private education that are afforded more opportunities in life are, are kind of faced with the same challenges when they have to make decisions about what they want to do. Uh, and so, yeah, I just want to name that is that you know, uh, what does it mean to find your power? What does it mean to, to confront the system and say, can we, can we fully fund black and brown schools? Can we, can we fund black and brown school districts? Um, can we, can we make a way for people like myself to be able to go back into those kind of school districts and be able to talk to young people about what are our options right and like how expansive are our options and like those things are not necessarily but we don't think about that I think um in a way that we should I don't think this is an either or and maybe it really draws on your experience as both a faith leader and as a community organizer but do you think uh, some of that work is particularly about organizing and strategy and that kind of the, the political analysis that you're speaking to, or, and, and again, I'm saying or, but maybe it's not or, or is it about, you've spoken about imagination and the vision and that, that process. So is it simply they all go together or do you feel like that it really leans in one direction because that, that process of magic, imagining, which I think you talked about with Claude last week again, is really something powerful in the context of particularly communities and individuals who've experienced trauma. Right. I think these things have to be both and. Right. I think it's it's not a go. It has to be a both and. We think about uh, this this critical race theory conversation in the South. Right. Uh, we think about the fact that uh, in the South, white supremacists are trying to literally take away our ability to be able to think 
for ourselves. They're trying to take away our ability to be able to uh, think about our history in a more expansive way. Uh, and so like, that's a policy conversation. You know, that means that some seats need to be flipped. Uh, that means that some House of Representative folks and some Senate folks need to need to leave. <laughs> uh, and in the same vein, and in the same vein, I think that communities, um, particularly, you know, folks who don't necessarily are organized on the policy side, uh, need to be thinking about, again, how do we, how do we think imaginatively, you know, because also we, we do know um, that sometimes the system fails us. And so, and, and, and for some reason, communities of color, communities of struggle, we find a way to make a way out of no way. And so I do think that, you know, there is that, that power and that possibility for, for imagination, but I do think that it has to be both and for sure. Uh, and not just, you know, not just in the South, but I think also here, you know, in Northern cities, uh, right. Because the, the same kind of thing applies. We think about, um, in the over the last couple of months, there have been conversations about the mayor, particularly cutting the education budget, right? And so we can talk about imagination all day long, but if we have people in power that are determined that they're going to cut the, the fundamental resources that we need in order to be able to tap into that imagination, you know, then then we, we're kind of lost here. So I think that it has to be a both and conversation. Thank you for that question, though. Yeah, I, I appreciate your reflection on uh, Congress right now. And um, we're going to be sending out an email tomorrow where uh, Reverend Hagler will be giving us some of his thoughts on um, the election and where it, place where it places historically. But Ethan, um, as we're approaching the top of the hour, I was wondering, and as we're talking about um, resources and opportunities like from community and since we have one that we offer the the wink fellowship i was hoping you could describe a little bit more um what that is for our folks delighted to ariel thank you and again i mean what a joy it is for us to share this um partnership with you uh tabitha in this way um um for um about a year and a half ago i uh, launched this new fellowship in the name of Walter Wink and June Keener Wink. Um, as Ariel described earlier, um, Walter, one of the most uh, significant uh, prophetic theologians of the past uh, half century, um, who had such a deep, rich relationship with the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Um, so, such a blessing for us to have collaborated with him in many ways. And I think one thing I would lift up uh, for folks, um, so, some of you have um uh, you know, subscribe to or picked up copies at different points. Those of you like Tabitha who've been in seminary and seen copies of Fellowship magazine on the maybe on the, the shelves of Union uh, uh, Library and all that. Um, Walter edited a, a column in Fellowship magazine for about a decade, and then um, and then it was the editor of a publication called Peace Is the Way: Writings on Nonviolence from the Fellowship of Reconciliation, and that's available from our bookstore. But his, his wife, uh, June Keener Wink, um, who has um, journeyed with us in terms of creating this extraordinary fellowship uh, opportunity um, that was launched, uh, and we were blessed last year to welcome Dr. Fernando Ona as our inaugural Walt Wink and June Keener Wink Fellow, and this year, Pastor Tabitha. And, and this fellowship is really to support um, these uh, emerging leaders in the work that they're doing in communities. Um, uh, we've, we heard last year from Fernando about the work he was doing in terms of public health and with uh, victims of torture and trauma in many parts of the world. And um, Tabitha has been sharing with us today and, and will be in, in the weeks and months ahead in, in different ways about the communities that she engages with uh, in the Bronx and New York City and beyond. Um, and so this is an opportunity for uh, everyone to learn more about the Wink Fellowship through um, the page on our website that describes it. And you can find videos uh, of some of the conversations we've hosted in that space, um, just forusa.org slash Wink. Um, and to, to support the fellowship in an ongoing way as we continue to build that out to being a fully endowed fellowship that we will be able to welcome other extraordinary uh, emerging leaders year upon year uh, for the work that they're doing um, in in their communities and and beyond, so um, that's a bit about the fellowship. Um, and um, uh, let's see here if we have any um, 
we have, I think, one one more question that we'll bring into the circle um, as maybe a, a, a coda and a closing point. And particularly because, Tabitha, you were sharing with us some, again, the extraordinary young people you've been working with um, in your community there in New York City. And as you as you are a bridge builder and a bridge walker, um, working with younger generations and, and elders, uh, both in the congregation that you pastored and other spaces, how do you really pick up on those intergenerational elements of how we pass along um, uh, lessons and, and how elder generations of activists, I mean, you know, FOR is a movement that's been around for now over a century. We're celebrating our 107 year anniversary this week. Um, how do you suggest that older uh, activists um, work with younger activists in, in significant and productive ways? What are some examples of what you've seen in terms of that kind of intergenerational partnership and and mutual mentoring? Yeah, thank you for that, for that question, Ethan. I think, um, so Sisters and Brothers United, I was saying, is a part of a larger organization called the Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition. And I really appreciate having uh, been on the board of the Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition and also just being able to work collaborative, collaboratively with them. Uh, because the framework is um, that, that members of the community are able to come and they're able to, uh, to, to think intergenerationally just because there is space, right? Just because there is a designated space for young people and then there is a designated space for all ages, right? And so like in the movement work, everybody's voice is important. Everybody's voice is heard. And I do think that, you know, and I grew up in... Um, I grew up as a strong member of the NAACP also. So I will also say that was also a place of intergenerational power at that time because I was a part of a youth council, right? And so what that meant was like, we would have our little separate youth meetings and then there would be a time where we're able to come together and be uh, with other generations. And so just being able to organize together, being able to strategize together kind of creates this possibility for um, for intergenerational engagement. Um, and I think that I think that more, um, more organizing needs to be intentional about that, right? Right, is, is creating kind of a youth unit, if you will. Um, because I think that when young people feel as though they are empowered, that they will show up, right? And I think that there's a lot to learn um, from that. You know, I, I, I love... You know, I love storytelling. I love community building. I've been able to uh, to see and witness uh, queer and trans young people uh, dancing at parties with, uh, you know, with older 70, 80 year old black ladies. And I just find it to be the most beautiful thing. But that space is intentionally created. It's intentionally curated. Right. So there is an intentionality, I think, um, on the behalf of the organization that just says like we want a we want young people here. Uh, we value their voice and not as um, not not that they are our second, but they are part of us. And so I think that's kind of a start to it. I'm not saying if I should get a youth unit, but, <laughs> you know, I think that as it relates to a lot of these organizations that I've that I grew up in and that I'm still a part of, I think that's a really big part of it. It's kind of that intentionality around uh, what does it mean for young people to be able to gather, you know, amongst themselves and also to be able to gather in large groups. So yeah, that's kind of that's kind of my answer around intergenerational uh, organizing and engagement. That's awesome. Well, uh, you're hosting these Wink Talks um, that you've just started at um, a place in New York City called the People's Forum. And when I had the great opportunity to visit there for the first time and uh, share space with you and Ariel just a few weeks ago, I was like, wow, that's an intergenerational space where. Uh, stuff is happening. Do you want to um, tell us more about um, your partnership, our, our partnership with the People's Forum and um, the Wink Talks? Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, so this is not something I expected at all. I did not expect that we would be uh, hosting, holding space in the People's Forum. But the first time I ever went to the People's Forum, about three or four years ago, I went to a dance class. I went to it. I mean, I went to a free like movement dance class and um, it was I mean, I just needed to move my body and I felt like I wanted to be in a safe space to do that. <laughs> and I went and then I found myself kind of going to some of kind of the political education talks. So they were, you know, they had different film screenings around different uh, movements around the country, around the world. Um, and they also just they just do a really great job of programming. So I would just say that um, this partnership is going to be very uh, fruitful. I'm looking forward to to because it's it's such an open concept. So that means that people just kind of come in and out. There's a cafe in this space. So it's kind 
that you're able to kind of engage people you normally wouldn't even notice or know that they're in that space and be able to kind of engage. And I think that what I'm interested in is being in conversation about the New Testament uh, with kind of a people's forum um, audience, if you will. I'm, I'm really interested in how that can go because it is a very intergenerational space. And you see a lot of people, I think, in their 20s and their 30s um, coming to hang out, coming for social events, and then also coming um, to kind of get educated and kind of become aware of what is happening uh, across this planet. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm excited about, about, um, about being in that in that partnership with the People's Forum, just to kind of see um, who I can make friends with um, and who will be a part of my life just from, uh, from going and sitting and being in that space. Just when somebody's saying, I'm interested in this, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a church person, but that seems interesting, you know? Um, interested in, in how that can be fruitful. That's awesome. Well, I'm gonna turn it over to Ariel. I'll say to everyone in the audience here that, we will be sharing with everyone a link to register for the next Wink Talk. They're on the second Thursday of the month uh, in December and January. Um, uh, so that'll be uh, December 8th, I believe, is the uh, second Thursday. I hope I have that right in my head um, at uh, 6.30 p.m. Eastern time, 3.30 Pacific. So look to receive that information so, so you can join Tabitha and her uh, conversation partners and all of us for that uh, special uh, uh, space. Ariel. I want to thank you so much, Tabitha, for joining us and for bringing hope. Um, I found a lot of hope in all that you had to say. And I want to thank everybody who joined this conversation. Uh, we will be putting it up on YouTube and the link will go out. And next month, these um, Gathering Voices takes place on the second Tuesday of each month at four o'clock. Next month, we will be talking about um, the war in Ukraine and what we can do to end this war. And we'll be talking with um, my one of my mentors, uh, Medea Benjamin from Code Pink. So you don't want to miss it. And we will send out the registration information to all of you. And um, all of you, thank you for, for joining us and have a wonderful evening.